Hi everyone, I'm back with episode four and a very exciting show today. This is an interview that's really close to my heart. Not only am I talking to a successful Earthrounder, but also a previous Earthrounder that once held the exact record that I'll be flying to, that I'll be uh, flying to beat. He became the youngest pilot and the first teenager to fly around the world in 2013, eventually losing that record to uh, Matt Guffmiller, which I'm sure a lot of you guys know. But the real metal of this guy was not the 27,000 miles which he flew around the world at 19. It was what happened to him two years later following a near fatal crash. But Ryan has been a great uh, advisor to me since I started this endeavour. He started just like I did, having to raise all the money uh, to make his dream a reality. So I'm really, really excited to have this opportunity to talk to him about his experiences then, his around the world record flight in 2013, and how that horrific plane crash changes life forever. So let's not keep him waiting. Hi Ryan, thank you very much for joining me. Hey Travis, thanks for having me. Well, I've actually been really looking forward to this interview, Ryan. Uh, you are one of my mentors and I have so much I want to talk to you about. Um, but I often get asked uh, uh, what made me decide to do this. So I'm actually going to start by asking you the same question. Uh, what made you want to become uh, the youngest pilot to fly around the world in 2013? Oh man, I was just this kid who always wanted more. Um, my dad was the local milkman. Uh, my mom was a stay-at-home mom. I grew up in uh, Australia uh, in a small coastal town. So we're just a pretty normal Aussie family. And I always like to tell people I was a pretty normal Aussie kid, right? Any more laid back, I'd be lying down. But for me, it was just, I had this want to always do something more. And I remember sitting reading a book on Charles Lindbergh, uh, obviously one of the greatest aviation pioneers of, of all time. And I remember reading that book and, and talking to a friend and I, I said to him, I'd love to do something like what those pioneering aviators did. And obviously we can't live in those times and it's hard to find firsts or, or records to break these days, but I really wanted to do something that kind of channeled the spirit that they had. And uh, he asked me what that may be. Uh, and I thought, well, you know, I could become the youngest person, the first teenager in history to fly solo around the world. And he said, well, why don't you? And from that point on, it became a uh, mission bigger than I ever imagined to, uh, to make that happen, to create history and break a record and, and all of that stuff. But uh, at the core of who I was, normal Aussie kid, it was all about pushing myself and my limits. Uh, it wasn't about media attention or any of that stuff that comes with it. It was purely about seeing what I could do as a normal kid, uh, you know, living in the time that we live in. Wow. Yeah, no, and that's amazing that you, uh, uh, you know, push yourself to do, to do, uh, to do this amazing challenge um, and uh, well, push yourself uh, to well, see, see how far you could push yourself really. Um, well, cause, cause you uh, flew around the world. When, when did you actually start flying and what were your early flying experiences? Well, I was a six-year-old kid when they put me on a Boeing 737, right? That was the very first time I ever went on an airplane. That was actually the first time any of my family went overseas. And I remember wow. sitting on that airplane and uh, taking off. I remember being pushed back in the seat. I remember zooming off the runway. Uh, I remember walking up to the cockpit. This was prior to September 11, uh, so we could actually visit the cockpit. So you probably don't remember a time. It makes me feel old uh, when you could <laughs> visit the cockpit. But uh seeing the, the buttons, the switches and everything that was involved in aviation. I was a six year old kid who discovered his passion and I'm a lucky, lucky guy to have discovered it so young. So I actually started learning to fly when I was 14. Um, now I had the goal to fly solo for the very first time on my 15th birthday. Um, I had read in a newspaper about a young kid who had done just that. And I was so envious. I was so jealous. I didn't even know you could, I thought you'd have to be able to drive a car before you could fly an airplane. Um, but I remember reading that article and setting that goal. So at 14 years old, uh, with two after school jobs, I saved up my pennies and I funded, um, excuse me, I just had COVID. So I'm going to cough throughout this video. But um, I remember uh, having those after school jobs, flying a, a flying lesson once every two weeks and flying solo on my 15th birthday. So, Wow. Yeah, well, um, I mean, that really shows me you're you're determined for it. Uh, I mean, I also remember first time I flew in a plane, felt you know, I I imagined I was just like that, you know, getting pushed into the seat, all, all exciting. And uh, yeah, no, I mean, that's that's amazing how you uh, uh, you know worked and managed to uh, uh, save up for uh, flying and going solo and getting your pilot's license. Um, and well, you know, eventually, uh, obviously, you 
you know, got your ratings and uh, your experience. Uh, and how, how many hours uh, had you logged before you, uh, before you took off for your annual flight? And what, what pilot qualifications did you have? So I was a commercial pilot um, with a into single engine instrument rating. And I had about 450 hours total. I actually uh, set off from Australia and on the longest leg of my journey, which was Hawaii to California, which was 15 hours, uh, I passed my 500th flying hour. So not a lot of hours, but uh, I had quite a few in the airplane that I was flying around the world. And I had quite a few that were dedicated to planning and preparing for the flight. So I was out there uh, flying the type of flights that I should have been uh, as advised by my mentors at the time. Uh, to make sure that I was ready to, you know, safely tackle the trip. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I mean, uh, you know, that, that's, a, that's a very small amount of experience compared to, you know, ferry pilots. I was talking to uh, uh, Kerry McCauley uh, a couple of weeks ago. He, you know, he has thousands of hours flying around the world. So, you know, flying around the world with uh, just a few hours, that's that, uh, j- just like me. So, uh, just like I'll be doing. So, you know, it's, it's a lot, a lot more challenging for, for, you know, people like us, um, you know, doing that. I know we had some conversations in the past, but can you tell the viewers uh, your experiences and difficulties in obtaining sponsorship for your around the world flight? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, we, we often talk about the flight itself. Um, for me, it was 24,000 miles. It was 70 days. It was 170 hours, you know, in a serious test, R22. So we talk about that 70 days as, you know, the focal point of the adventure when in truth, it really wasn't, you know, as much as that was an incredible period and it was very challenging and had all the emotions of a, a typical uh, adventure. It was the two years that we had spent as a normal Aussie family building a team and convincing an industry uh, that I was the right guy for the job. And this was a good idea. And we went from really having no idea how to create a proposal for a company. We can talk about this for hours to successfully raising almost a quarter of a million dollars on a laptop computer. And that was a laptop computer that my brother had to buy me because I didn't have a, uh, a laptop at the time, nor did I have the money to go and buy it. So I was actually unplugging my desktop Mac computer and putting it in the back of my car and driving it to my first job as a pilot and in between scenic flights, I'd be writing proposals to really big companies around the world and breaking all sorts of copyright laws and doing all sorts of stuff that I shouldn't have at the time. But um, the two year planning and uh, preparing kind of phase of the trip was incredibly hard, but it was a quality of preparation in that uh, period that allowed the flight to, to run pretty smoothly, really considering what it was. Yes. Well, I can, I can actually relate with that as well. I mean, it's uh uh, finding, uh, finding sponsors that, um, to, uh, well, fi- yeah, tr- finding people to email, writing it, uh, you know, creating all these packages, sponsorship packages for these, all these people. It's, I mean, it's, it's really hard. Um, and you're really time consuming as well for, for all of that. Um, yeah, but, it's a ton uh, of work, but I, I think you also have to, the reason that companies jump on board with, with someone like you is that you're doing it for the right reasons. Uh, so I had a lot of people come to me who wanted a free Breitling watch or they wanted to be, you know, on TV or whatever that may be. And in some cases they were getting themselves on TV even before they started to fundraise and plan. They had no idea what they were getting themselves into. So if you are doing this for the right reason and you have a level head on your shoulders and people think that you are going to do it safely, then those companies will start to jump on board. But it is a very, obviously, as you now know, a slow and hard process, but you know, the idea of flying around the world solo and, and breaking a, a youth-based record is really new. So back in 2008, the world record, I think was around about 37. It was in the high thirties. It was broken by Barrington Irving. Um, I was able to become the first teenager in history to have flown solo around the world. And since then there's been a number of flights and that makes your job harder because companies have seen this before and you know, it's a little bit, it's not as fresh, but at the same time, it also makes your job harder again because of your age and making sure that, you know, even though we are young that, and you are young right now that, you know, you tick the boxes required to do it and do it safely. So. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, uh, exactly. Um, and it's especially even harder now with uh, COVID as well. That really doesn't help at yeah. all. Um, uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's not, <laughs> I'm really struggling now to find uh, sponsors, but I mean, they're still coming. Um, but, uh, well, uh, talking back to the uh, route now that, uh, that to, to the route you took around the world, uh, I'm flying a completely different route uh, to the one you took flying around the world. Uh, my longest leg is uh, only about 850 miles. Uh, how long was the, was, yours, was your longest leg? 
My longest leg was the Hawaii to California leg. And it was about 2,130 miles. Um, so I can pop the route up here. You can see for me as an Australian, uh, I didn't have the opportunity to depart, you know, in the Northern hemisphere. And um, for us, it was a real journey from the bottom of the world to the top of the world and then back down again. And what that required was taking off from an airport just south of Sydney in Australia on the East coast. And then, flying uh, island hopping across the pacific ocean to all the way across the pacific ocean with that longest leg being hawaii to california i then zoomed down through north america and up uh, into canada prepared for uh, a really challenging part of the round the world flight which was the north atlantic crossing so that was up to iceland down to um, scotland and then through england france and greece and diverted around egypt uh, due to a crisis ended up uh, in aquaba jordan and then across to um, muscat oman uh, down to uh, where we go up to Oman, Sri Lanka, then Malaysia, then Indonesia, and then back into Australia. And then for the first time ever, I got to fly across uh, my own country, but uh, very different route to yours, as you say. And for me, it was a lot of long over water uh, legs for sure. Yep. Well, how, how did you find these uh, long over water legs? I mean, I would <laughs> find that, I mean, that long over water, that, that's terrifying to me. Yeah. And, and <laughs> it was terrifying to me too. Um, and I look back back at it now, the more experience I get, I think, you know, what was I thinking? Um, you know, but at the time it was, you know, that was part of the adventure was that we're taking this tiny single engine airplane and, and we are flying, you know, over these large oceans. So it was all about risk mitigation and, you know, accepting a certain level of risk. And, and that's what we did. Um, I found it very lonely over that water. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one point uh, on the way to California where if I looked at my avionics, I had a thousand miles. I was a thousand miles from anywhere in any direction to anything. Wow. I was just out in the middle of the blue. So there's some logistical issues with that, with search and rescue and stuff that you have to take into account. Um, so, you know, lots to think about, but I can tell you the Pacific ocean is really, really, really big. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a, uh, that's uh, a good thing that I'm actually, uh, avoiding it because you know unlike unlike your route as you can see behind me uh my uh my flight uh avoids all long uh, most long flights over the oceans uh was uh i'm not actually flying any long flights over the pacific um and this also reduces the need for a ferry tank um uh did you have a ferry tank and uh well can you can you tell uh can you tell us about how your, your plane and how uh, you kitted it out for the flight yeah, so I'll play a bit of a clip while we do that um, and talk about the round-the-world flight. So you'll see a little bit of footage here. But uh, my aircraft was a rented uh, single-engine Cirrus SR-22, 2009 model. Um, we purely rented that airplane dry hire um, to fly around the world. So if you think, if you've ever been to an airport under the age of 25 and tried to rent a car, it's kind of tough. Uh, but if you think that's tough, you should try and rent an airplane, fly around the world at 19. It's um, That was a bit of an adventure. And it was wild. Uh, I looked a lot younger and less stressed at that point in time, but I had a 160 gallon uh, bag of fuel in a, what was called a turtle pack bladder tank sitting in the back seat. So we actually removed the back seat of the, um, in the aircraft, we put a fake floor down and we had um, the bag of fuel across the top of that um, fake floor. So 160 gallons in the aircraft in the cockpit with me and then 92 gallons in the wing. So about 250 total. And that took an airplane that, you know, may fly for about five or so hours, six hours before it runs out of fuel and now allows it to fly for upwards of 17 hours, which was, sounds like a lot, but when your longest leg's 15 hours and you've got 16 and a half or 17 hours of fuel, it, it, it is definitely tight. And, and there was wind issues and all sorts of stuff on that leg. But um, we did have the ferry tank. We also had uh, in some of these clips, you'll see the life raft, um, Bob, he sat next to me the whole way around and uh, we had a ditch bag and we had a whole pump set up um, with both electric pumps, uh, redundant electric pumps, and then redundant hand pumps to make sure that if we were out over uh, the ocean at any one time and the pumps failed, we had a, another way to get that fuel out of the bag into the wing and then from the wing, obviously, into the engine and keep the, the airplane running. So, Wow. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I've got, uh, comparing that to my plane, um, obviously mine doesn't fly as fast as a uh, SR-22, but I've, uh, of course, I burn a lot less fuel. I burn about five gallons an hour. Um, and and uh, I'd, and because of that, and because of the, uh, my roots are a lot shorter, uh, my legs, I don't actually need a, uh, I don't need a bladder tank, ferry tank. Um, and uh, I have a thousand mile range with my longest uh uh, longest route being about uh, uh, 800, 850 uh, nautical miles. So um, 
uh yeah i can i can you know also it, it seems tight as again uh so it seems like a long distance still but uh, again it's, it's still quite tight oh I, obviously i still have the option to put a fairy tank in which would uh, uh definitely uh be uh well would make it a lot safer there um and you know you've been there and done that uh but what are the dangers that i should uh, look out for and and what advice uh, can you give to me and other want to be around the world pilots yeah, so um, when, and I think I talked to you about this in the beginning, was, you know, I'm still young, I'm 27. And, you know, I flew around the world when I was 19. And I started planning when I was 17. And and we had a lot of media around my flight, we, we ended up with 60 minutes, and we ended up with uh, lots of episodes on the Today Show and all sorts of stuff. We had newspaper and print media all around the world. And lots of award ceremonies and stuff afterwards that kind of spread the world of the, uh, the word of the flight. Plus, uh, which I'm sure we'll talk about. There was a book as well called Born to Fly. So um, I had a lot of uh, young, I would say kids, but a lot of young people come to me and say, hey, I want to fly around the world too. Can you talk to me about it? I had a guy two days ago come to me and ask. Um, so lots of people want to know more. And it's it was that media and the media from some of the other around the world flights that spread the word to say, hey, this is something that you could do. And it's a pretty wild life-changing adventure. So my what I say to everyone is, you know, and we've already talked about this and you're well beyond this, but you have to make sure you're doing this for the right reason. Mm. If you are doing this to get on TV, then you're wasting your time and you will end up taking shortcuts and it'll become dangerous. So you have to remember at the end of the day that taking a single engine airplane and flying it so far around the world is not necessarily that dangerous, but it is uh, definitely more risky when you consider that the pilot inside is young, relatively quite inexperienced and hasn't had the experience to say the ferry pilots have had of thousands of thousands of hours and hundreds of hundreds of crossings and all of that kind of stuff. So you have to make sure you're doing it for the right reason. And that's got to be within you. Um, after that, you have to make sure that you plan a safe route. Now, yes, the house was over water and, and, and quite a lot, a lot of over water flying, but we prepared for that in the best way possible. Um, my advice is to, uh, not look at your trip uh, as one big around the world flight. And I know I had to do this to maintain mental sanity. Um, but mine was a 24,000 mile trip that happened to be about 35 or six legs from A to B. So it was 35 or six A to B flights. And that's all that mattered. All the flight plans were done beforehand. Everything was all prepared and prepackaged. Um, I did not fly back to back days. I always had a day off in the middle. And I really treated that as lots of separate flights. They just happened to, after 70 days, connect the dots uh, all the way around the world. Um, so I think making sure that you have the right mentors uh, and an incredible team around you, making sure that you more than anything have prepared incredibly well. Um, that's important for any adventure. It doesn't matter whether it's sailing around the world or flying around the world or climbing a mountain, it doesn't matter. Uh, and making sure that uh, you are mentally prepared uh, push it back if you have to. If you're not experienced enough, push it back. You know, make sure that you do it and you do it right. Don't be pressured by a record. Um, I will tell you, and I tell this to everyone at work, it's a keynote speaker, that by the time I actually got home, my mum forced me to submit the Guinness World Record paperwork. I didn't want it. It was at that point, I just did not care about it because what I discovered was I'd been for 70 days flying around the world. I'd learned so much about myself. I'd learned so much about my team i'd realized what a big thing we'd undertaken and i'd put so many people through a lot of stress but at the end of the day we'd all achieved it together and it wasn't about a record it was about the lives that we impacted and the people we influenced and inspired along the way and as cliche as that sounds it, that was what mattered and whether it be a 12 year old kid who says yep i'm gonna learn to fly and we had so many of those or whether it be i actually had world war ii uh fighter pilots spitfire pilots uh two of them in fact write me handwritten letters and that to me, you know, they're my heroes. So um, what you're going to do is going to have a big impact. So for, for you or anyone else who wants to do it, you know, do it for the right reasons and plan and prepare well and, you know, accept the risk and, and go for it. Great. Yeah. Th thank you so much for the advice, Ryan. It's, it's really great. Uh, I'll definitely take that advice on board. Um, uh, you know, I also, uh, I also, you know, uh, think of the Iran world flight as, uh, you know, just, just, you know, uh, just, flights you know, spread out um that also just link up the dots around the world um obviously a bit more challenging in a, a lot of places um but you know basically keep it make sure yeah it was all about me uh how you, how you are mentally as well so um uh well that's how that's uh 
that's that's what I that's how I um, uh, think of the around the world flight. Um, but now, can I ask you about uh, that uh, fateful day in uh, in December uh, in 2015, and you were 21? What what happened then? Absolutely, um, man. My life's been a wild roller coaster of, of highs and then lows. So uh, after the round the world flight, I came home, and you'll recognize this guy um <laughs> of all people prince william um i was able to meet prince william and meet prince harry so here i am like this normal as a kid being asked to meet the royals mm -hmm. which was just wild in my head i'd never expected it and it was still one of the coolest things i've ever had happen in my life it was an honor just to be invited you know even more so than being there um we did publish a book born to fly uh that went out so it was a great way to kind of continue to share the story um and the reason i you know i was even I was named one of Australia's 50 greatest explorers. You know, I'm the kid who can't make his bed. And I was put in that list, you know, I tell you that not because of an ego trip. I think, you know, manufactured drama and ego will ruin anything you ever do. It doesn't matter whether you want to fly around the world and break a record or whether you want to cure cancer, you got to make sure you do it without ego. So I don't tell you those things from an ego point of view. I tell you those things because I want you to know my life was really good. It was awesome. Um, I turned down a job with my dream airline and I took a job flying uh, vintage airplanes. And specifically, I took that job because my dream in life is to fly a Spitfire. That's my dream. Um, one of my heroes is Douglas Barter. So Douglas Barter, not Tin Legs Barter. Um, and we'll talk more about him. But my dream was to fly the Spitfire. I wanted to go and continue to get experience in, in warbirds and old vintage aircraft. And that's exactly what I did. So my job was to fly Tiger Moth, a beautiful Tiger Moth. It was bright yellow, up and down the coast of Australia. That was my job. And on the 28th of December, 2013, I went to work, just a normal day at work. We, we weren't crossing oceans or doing anything wild. It was just a normal day at work. We jumped in the airplane. A gentleman uh, was in the front and I was in the back and we took off. The plan was to fly up the beach, do some light aerobatics, come in on land. And we took off. Everything was normal. Soon as the runway disappeared beneath the nose, the engine failed. And within three seconds, despite what, I could do with every, you know, ounce of experience I had uh, within three seconds, trying to find a place to go, it all ended and it ended in a horrific, horrific plane crash. Uh, I was just short of 22 years old. Uh, I was cut from the wreckage. Uh, I can show you a little bit of footage here. I was cut from the, now this isn't real footage, but that's the aircraft that I was flying. I was cut from the wreckage. Uh, I was placed in a helicopter and I was airlifted to hospital as the only survivor. Uh, within a split second moment, everything had changed in my life and I had ended up uh, with five breaks in my back, shattered facial bones, removed ankle, uh, shattered beyond belief, cuts and bruises, head to toe. And they operated on me immediately that night and they put me in a recovery ward. I woke up the next day with no movement or feeling below my waist. I was a complete paraplegic. So the very thing that had given me my identity, which was aviation, was everything that I lived and breathed for, uh, was now the very thing that took it all away. And I was faced with six months in hospital, a year and a half in rehabilitation. I was uh, faced with this long journey of, you know, hopefully getting back to walking and more than anything, I just wanted to get back to flying. Um, and that's exactly what happened. I spent, uh, you know, that six months in hospital, that's the first time I ever stood up. This was wheelchair basketball. Um, this was some of the steps I was taking in the walking frames as I managed to get back to my feet. Uh, it was a wild, wild journey that didn't just result in learning to walk, but it resulted in learning to fly again and, and finding, you know, a way to get back into the air. Um, I can no longer fly airplanes with toe brakes. So, uh, that still allows me the opportunity to hopefully one day fly a Spitfire as it does have handbrakes, but it actually led to the purchase of this airplane, which is super special, uh, 1952 Piper Super Cub, and his name's Doug. And he's actually named after Douglas Barter, the World War II double amputee Spitfire pilot. So uh, he really is my hero. But I also uh, wanted to pursue commercial flying, and um, this was my first solo in a helicopter as an incomplete paraplegic, uh, still with no feeling in my feet, the backs of my legs are where I sit, no push in my feet, no calf muscles, no glute muscles, no internal systems such as bladder and so on. Still very damaged, but able to pursue helicopter flying. Uh, and I went on to gain that commercial license and, and be able to fly a helicopter around, which was super cool. So um, that, that day uh, changed my entire life. I'll just let this clip run. There's a really cool clip of uh, 
flying over Sydney Harbour. Uh, we'll just see. Here we go. So that's the Sydney Opera House. This is one of my favourite clips ever. Uh, a couple of years ago, just before coronavirus hit, and this is 500 feet over the southern pier of uh, the Harbour Bridge, looking up at the flags as we go across. So um, that day was tough. Um, changed my entire life, and um, it it'll never be the same again. But I'm also grateful to be here and and to you know share the lessons that I learned going through that process. Wow. Well, that's a, that's an amazing story. Um, uh, that, I mean, what, what you must've gone through must've been, uh, must've, well, must've been crazy. Um, it makes my, uh, broken leg, uh, I broke a few years ago <laughs> seem a lot, uh, <laughs> seem like nothing. Um, uh, I mean, that's, I mean, your life has been, yeah, full of ups and downs. Um, but I mean, talking about the ups, uh, what would you say your uh, biggest achievement has been? <laughs> oh gosh. Um, I think probably just remaining a normal Aussie kid, despite all the wildness that ever happened in my life. And I, I mean that honestly, because it's, it's so easy to forget who you are. And, and for me, it doesn't matter whether you're flying around the world or whether you're writing a book or, you know, talking to Prince William about, you know, want to fly around the world in a helicopter. Um, it, it's all comes back to who you are as a normal person. I always tell the story that after I met Prince William, I was in that room talking to him and all the food was being handed out and I was a typical 19, 20 year old kid. I didn't want to eat all the funky food at this reception. It was all green and caviar and this and that. So I ended up actually leaving Prince William, uh, getting in my car and driving to KFC and eating KFC that night in this really expensive suit. And that was the moment that I realized I was still a normal Aussie kid at heart. So uh, for me, my biggest achievement is just being true to myself. And now with the Turbulent Stuff brand, it, it's trying to help other people you know, pursue their wildest dreams like you're doing um, and to do it safely and do it right. Um, but also uh, use adversity and the challenges they, they face to become turbulence tough, to have that kind of mindset to help ride out the bumps. So, Great. Great. Well, I mean, as we're talking about uh, you and your, uh, your life right now, uh, what made you leave Australia for the U S <laughs> well, it was all a speaking career. It's what I, I was flying the helicopter one day and, um, I can't feel my feet, as I mentioned. And I remember flying, I had a great day of flying and I got back in my car and I went down to the grocery store to buy some food for dinner. And I remember thinking my foot feels funny. So I took my shoe off and I found a rock in my shoe and that rock had eaten into my foot and it had been in my shoe all day and it, it had worked its way into my foot. So I went straight to hospital and then I ended up spending two months back in the wheelchair. And it was at that point in time that I realized that I had to take care of my body but more than that, we had a story that could impact. And even though I wanted to be a pilot permanently full-time, that's what I wanted to do. I couldn't let the, the story and the lessons within that go to waste. So uh, I decided to pursue speaking. I'd already done a, quite a chunk of it after the round the world flight before the accident, but I decided to pursue it really seriously and professionally and to do that in the U S. So I um, moved to the Nashville area in Tennessee. That's where I, I now live. And I have a Tennessee girlfriend and I have a whole life here with great friends and family and, just waiting on the borders to open so we can go back home and sit on the beach and go back to Australia. But now um, I definitely moved here for work is, is the answer. Great. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Well, um, that's awesome, Ryan. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, well, I just need to ask you now um, because uh, uh, well, because I know already um, and I don't want to tell my audience, uh, what car do you drive? <laughs> Uh, well, I'm guessing you probably don't mean my white truck. I just have a plain white American truck that I drive around and call it my dad truck. But um, when I was, I, I do know what you're talking about. When I was, uh, I first moved to the US, my dream was to own a pink Cadillac, right? And a, a, an old pink Cadillac, just like I always had. So I went to Graceland's and I bought this. You can see it there. It sits up on my shelf. And that is a model pink Cadillac. And uh, I remember buying that. And my housemate saying to me, what are you doing? And I said, well, I just bought a pink Cadillac, you know, and I'm going to, one day I'm going to buy the real thing. And um, sure enough, a year later it, it came up and it was, it was there for sale. And I saved up all my pennies and I purchased this, which is a 1960 pink Cadillac called flow. And um, it's been just the most incredible machine. And I've never seen anything that, you know, brings more smiles and laughter with people when you take it out and take it for a drive around town. We've had, People sit in it and take photos with it. We found it on dating profiles unexpectedly. People taking photos with it in the car park, and um, and now at work, I talk about this whole concept of what's your pink Cadillac, you know. So um, flow is is my pink Cadillac. So if you're ever in Tennessee, we'll uh, we'll jump in it and go to lunch. 
great yeah no i love it uh that car looks amazing um sure yeah if i'm if i'm there whenever i'm flying around i'll definitely stop by that'd be great i love to see the uh, kind of like i love cars so yeah cool um <laughs> i can't i can't wait to visit go for a drive um well, okay, let, let's uh, let's finish up with uh, well, a few must-ask questions. Uh, what would you say to other youngsters to inspire them to follow their dreams? I, my dad always said you can do absolutely anything you want provided your head's screwed on right, right? That's a really kind of Aussie kind of dad thing to say. And what he was saying was provided your dreams, they can be lofty dreams, they can be big and, and audacious, but they have to be somewhat realistic. So if you want to fly, uh, fly your refrigerator to the moon next week, that's what I always say. If you want to fly your refrigerator to the moon next week, it's probably not going to happen, right? You can't strap wings on it. It's just not going to happen. But if you do want to say fly around the world or you want to learn, like even forget the flying around the world aspect. If you want to learn to fly an airplane, you know, if you want to sit in an airplane at 15 and fly it on your own, if you want to, all of this stuff is possible. And we all have our own unique circumstance, you know, of, you know, financial kind of freedom or, or lack of freedom where we live, uh, the language we speak, you know, our family, friends, our support network, uh, the country we live in. But for the most part, a lot of these uh, obstacles that you see as deal breakers are, are easily overcome or maybe not easily overcome, but can be overcome in many cases by um, putting a plan together. So, um, my encouragement to anyone who has this wild out there dream is to start to do some research and ask for mentors, go out there and find people who've done something uh, similar or, or have done what you have done and, and ask them for help. And if you're the right guy for the job, if you're doing it for the right reason uh, and you got your head screwed on, right, then you'll get help and um, you'll be able to go and, and make it happen. And, and I really push young kids to, if you're 14, 13, 15, 16, 17, and you're at school and you can get an after school job or you can learn to fly. You know, I was on $7.65 an hour and I'd work an hour and 45 minutes on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and the boss would pay me for two hours. I'd wash a truck on Saturday and that combined was $190. And my one hour of flying was $180. And once you start to, to think like that and work hard, you'll gain so much respect from the people around you. So, you know, if it was 1.2 of flying and you know, my flying instructor would knock it back a bit because he knew that I was spending all my pennies on it. So like, you, you do get that help as time goes on. So um, yeah, that's my advice to anyone with a wild out there dream. Great. Great. Well, uh, talking about mentors, you're, you're definitely one of my, uh, my, <laughs> one of my mentors. So hundred uh, percent. So um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but uh, I actually want to find out even more about you through your book. Um, uh, can you tell me about your book and uh, how we can order it? And uh, actually, who do you want to play uh, you in the movie? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the correct answer is like Chris Hemsworth or some good-looking Aussie dude. But I'm, I'm sure that's probably not gonna uh, it's not gonna work out looking like me. But um, gosh, I you know I just want to get the story out there, and you know we laugh about movies and stuff like that, and I'd I'd love to you know, any platform just like this. And I appreciate being on is the more we can kind of share stories and, and, and get it out there is, you know, the more impact we can have. So I did write a book. Uh, this is the American uh, version two uh, edition. Um, I always say it's a book full of spelling mistakes. My name can tell you every page number of every spelling mistake in that whole book. But uh, Born to Fly was a very simple recount written by a very simple kid um, after he'd flown around the world. And for me, it was all about, you know, being able to share the story and you're going to find the same thing is you're going to see some pretty incredible stuff, you know, lava flowing into Hawaii, into the ocean or 60,000 foot thunderstorms or, you know, glaciers over the North Atlantic, castles in Scotland, nine hours of desert in Saudi Arabia, you know, you name it. There were so many things that I saw, but I was the only one to see it. So, and I really struggled with that because I wanted to share it with everyone. You know, like you obviously have a great support net network around you. So I wanted to, I wanted everyone to be able to come with me in that little airplane and experience it. Uh, I didn't think it was fair that I was the only one who got to see it all. So Born to Fly was my way to give the best recount I possibly could and to put that down on paper. And then, you know, if someone wanted to read it and learn more about it, then they could. So um, Born to Fly is out there. If you are in the US, it's available on Amazon. You can jump on and grab a copy. Um, or you can send me an email, ryan at ryancampbell.co. It's not .com. Can't afford the M yet. It's ryan at ryancampbell.co is my email. So feel free to reach out. If you'd like a copy, I'll, I'll have the uh, crew pack one up and we'll send one out. Great, great. Well, you heard that, guys. Um, I'll also post all the details uh, of how to order the book and uh, the email in the uh, description of the video so you can uh, check it out all there. Um, 
But anyway, Ryan, uh, this has been an absolutely amazing interview. Uh, one of the best. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> um, I know we'll definitely speak again, um, but it's been really great talking, uh, talking to you today. And thank you for sharing your story with us. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in the US. Absolutely, mate. I look forward to it. Thanks for having me. Great. Yeah, thanks again. And uh, thank you all for watching. Uh, that's it for this for uh, this week. I hope you really enjoyed it. Uh, enjoyed Ryan's story just as much as I did. Uh, see you guys next week. Until then, stay, stay healthy, stay safe, and don't forget to like and subscribe. See you later.